All right, how to boxing. Uh, glad to see you today. We have an incredible guest, a man who, who knows how to fight in multiple ways. He's a former UFC world champion, the first world champion in his weight division um, back when it was different arts against different arts. And I believe he is the pioneer or one of the pioneers for creating true mixed martial arts, mastering different domains of fighting and bringing all those tools together to create the Militage fighting system. So none other than Pat Militage. Welcome, Pat. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. This is, this is pretty cool. I, I've not been on, you know, boxing podcasts very often. I was on with Al Bernstein once, but um, usually it was always mixed martial arts stuff. Right. And, and it is a combat. Boxing is one of the combat sports. Definitely um, don't have as many weapons as MMA. Right. And, uh, you know, as far as as far as that goes, I know your I believe your career started probably in high school wrestling or even junior prep pup wrestling. Um, take us well, back to the beginning. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I um, I remember I was I was walking to a there was a tryout going on for wrestling at the elementary school down the road from where I lived in, in Bettendorf here. And back then, you know, you just wear. You know, like we were the old Chuck Taylors. I wrestled in those when I was in like kindergarten, first grade. You know what I mean? Because okay. um, I, I, you know, my mom didn't have any money and stuff. So I, that, I, those were shoes that I wore doing everything. Right. That's all I had. So anyway, uh, but on the way there, this kid, maybe I ran my mouth. I don't know. It's been so long ago, of course, but I was about five or six years old. And uh, he took me down really easy. And slapped me around a little bit and i found out that he was the son of the uh sorry about this it was the son of the middle school wrestling coach okay and so i said okay i'm definitely going out for wrestling now that's that's that got me started so i didn't want to mess with any wrestlers anymore unless i knew how to do it so yeah i started wrestling i believe it was kindergarten first grade right in there and uh wrestled into college um and in my teenage years for a little while, I went to uh, Pena's Boxing Club when it was at, at the Armory. Remember okay. at the Armory over there? On Brady? Yeah. So I went there for a little while. Um, and wrestling and football kept me pretty busy, so I couldn't, couldn't go a lot. But um, And, yeah, I just I had to leave college early, take care of my mom. She got sick with heart problems and stuff, so I had to pay some bills. And I was working three jobs and started doing, uh, started doing martial arts. Um, because a guy on my concrete crew that I was working, um, he was from Kentucky and he said, uh, karate guys could beat up a wrestler any day. And he was my boss technically. And he invited me to go out in the field and find out. Okay. <laughs> and so, now his name so wasn't took, Nick Tarpin, was it? No, well, no, but it was the, that's where I ended up. I went to Tarpin's for, for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, before I started my own thing, but, but yeah, I just took the guy down and, and uh, held him down basically he was from kentucky had a, a pretty southern southern drawl to him it's pretty funny and uh so that's really kind of by chance that's how i ended up you know doing karate doing kickboxing and then getting into the other martial arts and then eventually going back down to Pena's and sparring with a lot of the guys down there and donating blood quite a bit until i could at least figure things out you know what i mean right so but yeah. you were a true, I mean, from the beginning, you really were pretty well-rounded. I know when the UFC first started, it was kind of like a traditional boxer versus judo or a wrestler versus a karate guy. Like kind of like when you guys went out in the backyard and, you know, with that guy and you took him down. So it was like art versus art, but you kind of were one of the pioneers of truly mixing the arts. Well, I observed, you know, when I was training and, you know, I was fighting K1 rules, kickboxing and doing some other stuff. Um, and of course had the wrestling background and, and, uh, I was observing the guys in the early UFCs. Um, they were so stubborn. It was like a religion almost, or it was like a dogma, like a, like, um, uh, almost like politics, right? It just, you got to stick to your, um, got to stick to your guns, no matter what, this and that, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I noticed there was some ego involved in that, right? Like I'm a wrestler. I'm not going to learn anything else. Cause I can beat everybody with wrestling. That was the mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And all arts have strengths and weaknesses. And so that was something that I observed and I thought, you know, 
I want to be good, as good as I can be at everything um, so that I can find a weakness in somebody, you know, and that that's kind of where that all came from because I was a good wrestler, but, you know, I wasn't a world-class wrestler. I was, I was a good wrestler. I beat some very good wrestlers. Um, but, uh, but that was where it came from was, I, I guess in, in retrospect, I was lucky that I loved football a lot more than wrestling. So I wasn't a great wrestler and uh, didn't depend on it. Right. And have that same ego set. Right. And that helped you become, like I said, a pioneer. And, and I don't know, I mean, you know more about the history definitely of MMA, but you know, I don't know who, who else was in that era with you that really started to say, Hey, you know what, let's learn some jujitsu. Let's learn some different. Techniques. Well, the, I mean, uh, guys like, you know, Ken and Frank Shamrock, um, who were, who were very good fighters, of course, very skilled guys. Uh, Frank was very talented and, uh, Marco Huas from Brazil. Marco Huas was very good at jujitsu and, and a brutal kickboxer. Um, so it was just guys like that, you know, that were, that were well-rounded. Um, uh, but they were, I guess on top of it, you know, you're, you're from the Midwest here in the quad cities. So, you know, how tough people were just from here in general mm -hmm. and from, from this part of the country. So having, you know, all those tough, you know, the, the blue collar towns and the, and the, uh, the farm kids and stuff that they're, they're just, they're, everybody's tough. They're rugged, hard workers. And so it's, it was, I think it was pretty a lot easier to build a great team because of that. You know what I mean? Just, just rugged, tough, tough guys. And before we go into your team and that kind of wrap us up, um, you know, I always tell fighters is look, you're going to spend more of your time not fighting than you are fighting. And so you need to use boxing or use MMA as a vehicle to become who you want to be. And of course, win the championships, whatever, whatever your heart's desire in your sport, but that there's life after boxing. And we're going to get into life after the cage um, sure. at the end of this. But kind okay. of take us to the end of your career and also some of the highlights. Um, say, say for example, winning, I mean, becoming the first UFC champion in your weight class. What was that experience like? Well, it certainly was a long road getting there, of course. Every, everybody understands that. You know, um, when, I, when I won the UFC tournament, and technically I was the champ at that point uh, before I fought in Brazil against Mikey Burnett. But um, I remember signing my first autograph on one of the programs. And as I was signing the, the, uh, my autograph, one of my, a tear fell on the page. Mm -hmm. So it was just that moment. It was like, wow, I, I finally did it. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah. You know, it, when I think back about it and I don't think about the fighting days, it's like a different life. I don't really think about it very often. I don't talk about it very much. So, um, but yeah, that was a, that was a good moment. And you know, what's funny is I got home and, uh, you know, I showed my belt off to my mom and, you know, a couple other people or whatever, but I, I put it in a, I put it in a storage room in the basement. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that big of a deal. Right. What I realized after winning, after winning it, and that's the thing kind of with all my belts, they're kind of in storage and stuff. One's on display down in Las Vegas uh, at the UFC uh, Training Institute, uh, Performance Institute down there. But uh, it wasn't the belts; it was the it was the process and the people, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it was about. It was about making all those friends, all those experiences. Um, you know, that's that's what it was about. And and really, if if fighters, period, in general, uh, MMA, boxers, any art if they focus on the process and the people, cause it takes people to get there. You had a ton of different type of sparring partners, uh, guys yeah. you rolled with guys, you sparred in boxing. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, if they fall in love with that, does it make it that not easy? It's definitely not easy, but does it prepare them much better than just focusing on that highlight real moment? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is I think a lot of people miss, um, the reason they're doing something. And, you know, I was motivated by, you know, um, uh, not being able to compete, you know, having to leave school early, uh, having a dream of doing something big, uh, and certainly doing something. My, my two oldest brothers had committed suicide. Mm. So they were both, they were both abused by uh, Catholic priests. 
So they had committed suicide and it, it tore my mom's heart out. So I wanted to do something big to make my mom proud. That's that's wow. kind of what, what really drove it. Now, I, I hate to dig too deep into that, um, but your your brothers, now did you grow up, were they so much older or did you actually grow up with them in the house and they're, they're around? They were, uh, my two oldest brothers were 10 and nine years older than me. Okay. And so they were, they were out of the house, you know, while I was still pretty young, okay. obviously. So. But still um, your brothers, obviously, and impacted your mom in a tremendous way. And Sure. Yeah. No. And I, I looked up to those guys quite a bit. I mean, one, uh, my oldest brother, Bill, became a, a millionaire, multimillionaire by the time he was in his God mid twenties. And my brother, Tom was, um, an air force officer, graduated from the university of Iowa. Um, and then was working for a corporation up in Minneapolis. And, um, uh, when my, when my brother Bill had committed suicide, well, it, it affected my brother Tom because it was that they both were very close. They were bonded very close because of the experience and the trauma that they had been through. So it eventually, I think the demons got to my brother Tom too. So, Wow. You know, that's something um, I work with a lot of, a lot of fighters, athletes online, actually. And I have a program, I call it the Warrior's Way. And it's really about transformation, about kind of unloading some of the baggage, um, yeah. you know, through the yeah. power of forgiveness. I mean, there's definitely freedom on the other side of forgiveness and uh, not that anyone deserves. It's not about the other person. It's just about ourselves as individuals. Like we're no longer going to carry this burden, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's definitely yeah. one of the aspects of, of what I do, aside from the technical. I love the technical and strategy and all that. But the life side right. of it to me as a, as a coach, as a trainer is more fulfilling. Um, and I know you've touched a lot of lives as a trainer. And so let's move into that. But, um, I know one young man that we both worked with, uh, Sherman tank. Um, I mean, share with us about tank and then just some of the other guys you've, you've had a chance to just help as human beings. Um, yeah. aside from the world champions, I know at one time you had the welterweight, the middleweight and the heavyweight UFC world champion simultaneously. Um, so you right. were a very dominant program. Um, yeah, time, no, and, but, uh, you know, with Sherman, as I got, you know, when I was young and coaching and still fighting, it was different, you know, because I had that killer mindset, that killer be killed. And as I got older, you know, I think I started looking at it a little bit differently. And I, I cared more about, you know, certainly I always stressed defense. I didn't want to be the guy you know, who couldn't spell my name when I was 50 years old, that, that sort of stuff, you know, because I, I did have conversations when I was young with, you know, older boxers, guys that were brawlers, mm -hmm. um, old kickboxers. And you could tell the damage, had, you know, really there had been some severe damage uh, done mm -hmm. to those guys. And that's something that I didn't, I really didn't care to experience that later on in life. So uh, something that I cared about, but Sherman uh, Pendergast was, was starting, you know, he was losing fights and he was getting hurt. And I was, I was, I was getting pretty concerned. And, um, I had this conversation with somebody, um, probably two weeks ago, just remembering him. And so anyway, um, I called him into my office and I said, Hey, I go, uh, I, I think you should stop fighting. You know, I, you're getting hurt a lot. I don't, I don't want to see that. And I said, in your, you keep losing weight and going down in weight divisions to fight in the lower weight divisions, looking for a win. And I said, I'm pretty, that's, that's showing desperation to me. And he said, Pat, he said, I'm not cutting weight to get down to lower weight divisions. I've got terminal cancer and I'm fighting just because I want to fight. And I was like, wow. You know, mm -hmm. at that point, what do you say? You know, what do you say to a guy who's, you know, so when he passed away, you know, it, 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 uh, yeah, it was a tough one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, I mean, I I knew I knew when I met him, he was just this big like like carved out of granite, muscular yeah, yeah. guy. And then to see him uh, near the end, I mean, just shrivel up. Yeah. Um, you know. I yeah, mean, that was it's, tough. It's humbling. It was tough. It's but he was a great guy. He was a great guy. You know. Great he and guy. I, uh, he and I had some real good conversations. He made me laugh a lot. Yeah, he, he was a funny, he had good sense of humor, and deep, too, in, in many ways, deep, when you talk to him about life. Um, I had some pre- and post-conversations with him, you know, with our training sessions. Right, uh, right. But just a, just a unique individual and, and a beautiful soul. Yeah.
Yeah, definitely. So I'll always remember him. That's for sure. But yeah, all the guys, you know, were uh, brought something unique. And it was uh, when you've got a. Uh, at one time, we had over 40, 40 some guys ranked in the top ten in the world. So you got a wrestling room packed with with that many alphas. You know, it was there was some. There was some fun, interesting moments in that I, room. I, I bet you had great uh, sessions, um, rolling sessions, sparring sessions. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Was, it was it, it got it got pretty crazy at times, and, uh, but uh, there, a lot of it's on footage, which is cool. I'm I'm glad that a lot of it got, got filmed and everything. But uh, just great, great times, man. Great intensity, and you know, guys that cared enough about each other. I mean, look, if I had an off day, I was going to get the hell beat out of me, and I had I got the hell beat out of me a lot. Right, yeah. like a lot of lot of scary guys in that room, and uh, if anybody else had an off day, they were going to get the hell beat out. Of them. We we weren't, we were never malicious with each other. Like if somebody got rocked with something, we, nobody's going to go in for the kill and head right. kick them or anything. You know, um, they would gladly hit you with a liver shot though and put you down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and on and on any on any given day, like you're saying, you might be handing out a butt whooping or you might be receiving one, and, yeah. and that's really yeah. the best environment training environment i think any any fighter could ever ask for sharp keep you sharp in life man hold you accountable right no doubt that's yeah. the thing and i i remember one time uh after uh it was a wrestling practice and hughes kicked my ass he kicked kicked my ass and we were sitting in the locker room sitting there in our shorts and t-shirts after practice and i'm sitting on a bench in the locker room and hughes is sitting on another bench and uh he says, he looks at me and he goes, that was when I was the UFC champ. And he goes, he goes, you better keep looking over your shoulder, old man. He goes, I'm coming for you. And so while he was saying that, Rob Lawler's sitting right behind him. Robbie's like 17 at the time, 18. And I go, oh, yeah? I go, look over your shoulder. And he turns around. He looks at Robbie and he goes, I see what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's always a passing of the torch. Speaking of Robbie Lawler, I remember uh, him coming down to spar one time. He was up at, at uh, Alley Cats with Jeff Perez okay. for yeah. boxing. And he was probably around 17 then. And I had a kid who, who actually was a national champ at that t um, Not at that time, but he had been a previous national champ. And so he was obviously a very skilled young boxer. And of course, you know, Robbie's not just exclusively on boxing, but he kind of got the best of Robbie. But although Robbie, Robbie could crack, he was a terrific puncher. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I, and I always tell the guy like, Hey man, you, you gave it to the, uh, UFC world champion one afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you remember the boxer? Uh, the kid was Jaime Garcia. Was okay. His name. Okay. And he didn't yeah. do a whole lot in the men's division. Uh, he had won a junior title. And that, I wasn't training him when he won that. He was at uh, Bob Kramer's gym and Chip Chinlin's gym in, in uh, Rock Island. He was okay. a little kid then. But then years later, when about 17, he tried to make a little comeback. And he came to bed then. I had a gym myself. and Right. You know, over. and uh, I watched Robbie spar um, with D-Ray Crane. D-Ray came over to my gym. Uh, D-Ray was because a terrific Robbie, kid. Yeah. Oh, my God. That, he, he was incredible. He was incredible. Um, and he he dropped Robbie, I think, with a liver shot. They went at it, though, man. It was it was impressive to watch those two go at it because Robbie was much older at the time um, than back in when he, when he sparred there at your place. But those were two scary men going at it, right? I mean, and Robbie had gotten to the level, and I was older, so I couldn't, I couldn't hang with him anymore. And I tell you what, watching D-Ray and him go at it, D-Ray was – D Ray was incredible. He was special. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was, was special. I mean, and I, I'm friends with D Ray on social media and stuff. And every once in a while, I message him and just say hi to him and stuff or whatever. And um, his hook, God forbid getting hit with that hook, man. That's scary. Yeah. He, he ended <laughs> up uh, in the program. I, I, so I was in the Army World Class Athlete Program under Bashir oh. Abdullah. And, okay. Um, D. Ray at the time was in NMU. They had Northern Michigan University on their campus. They had a kind of a satellite location. They called it the Olympic Training Education Center. So those kids got to go to college while they were training to make an Olympic team. So he was Very up cool. there, kind of the two rival teams in the country at the time. We had the best two teams in the country. And then uh, he ended up, and I'm a little bit older than him. But he ended up later, years later, uh, coming to that Army team, which was really cool because you got paid by your rank as a soldier. Um, oh, wow. But you yeah. got to wear tennis shoes and sweatpants all day. 
you know, you, you trained all day. And <laughs> so it's like you, you're living the dream, you know, you just yeah. train and you, you're, you're getting room and board and health benefits and, you know, the education That's benefits killer. when That's you get out. So, That's cool. Yeah, just like the wrestling team in the army, right? Yep. Yeah, actually, they were incredible. The wrestling team uh, back then, Sean Lewis. Actually, I was in there when Sean Lewis, Dramil Byers. They were they were all like roommates, and so Dramil Byers' room was right next to mine. Actually, I have a story okay. for you. Uh, one time, I'm in the hallway. You know, and it's a barracks, so it's like a yeah. narrow hallways. And right. we're going down the hallway, and here comes big Dramil Byers. You know, he's giant. And, he, and he's just joking around. He's like, oh, what? You know, who's going around who kind of? And, of course, I don't mind yeah. going around him. And so he posts up like this. He's like, oh, you want to you want a box for it? And I start laughing. And I'm like, hey, you don't want that, champ. You know what I mean? So he gets me to give him my lead leg. He does an ankle sweep. And, I'm, and he's holding me by my ankle. He pulled me up high enough so I didn't hit my head. And he's just holding me. I'm looking up at him and he's like you didn't know i was that fast and i looked up i said well i do now <laughs> and he put me down but so i was in there with all those those killer they had the best uh, greco-roman team in the country back then and i think they're still pretty competitive yeah. now uh gibson was gibson uh running that uh the the coach was a 96 olympian i'm trying to think of what his name was he was a head coach and then they had oh, and I think Gibson Gibson was uh, Gibson was on the Marines. He was a Marine. Okay. Coach. This was the he was Army a World Class Athlete Program. And they okay. had um trying to think of that coach's name, but he was an athlete in the ninety six Olympics. He retired okay. and he, he laid his shoes down. And then they had another old guy, um, trying to think of his name, but he was from Kazakhstan and he was contracted by the US Army to come. And I'm trying to remember his name, but one time I was in the wrestling room. And the guys were in there telling me, they're like, oh, yeah, this, you know, this old Russian coach um, who I had some conversations with him before. But he, they said he could beat any of us. And he was like an older guy. But they said he'll make you think he's going one way. And the next thing you know, you're flying the other way just because of Dude, I'm IQ. telling you. Yeah. Those guys at that level, um, yeah. you know, I was out at the uh, uh, Matt Lindland invited me out to the. Uh, Olympic training center out there in Colorado Springs. Okay. And I was watching a guy that probably was in his late forties. Uh, who's a coach out there. He's from one of the stands as well. And he didn't use his arms and the guys on the Olympic team couldn't take him down and he wasn't even using his arms. Wow. And that's how good they, that's how good those guys get. It's like Steve Rusk, who's from Rock Island or from okay. uh, Orion originally, but, He's a Rock Island County Sheriff's uh, deputy who trained with me for a lot of years. Uh, pound for pound, the, the most powerful human being I've ever been grabbed by. A ridiculous power. And he was a national champion. And he told me one time um, that uh, Mark, uh, dang it, what's his name? Mark, that was the coach of the University of Illinois. I don't okay. know why I'm forgetting his name. Uh, who was an Olympian, world champion um, from over there in Moline or Rock Island originally. Okay. Mark, um, what's that? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not going to come up with it. I don't know why I'm forgetting it because I never have forgotten his name ever in my life. But anyway, <clears throat> it's not Sam or something, is it? No, no. Uh, I'll I'll remember it right after we hang up. But uh, uh, Steve Russ said, and as good as Steve was, and as powerful as Steve was, he goes, "I never took him down once when I wrestled for him at the University of Illinois. Mm. Not one time." And it's and a that, lot of that's IQ and and strength too, and uh, experience and yeah. and that's what he that's he said that um, his coach could take a straight bar with two forty five pound plates on each side that's two hundred twenty five pounds mm -hmm. and just curl it ten times like it was nothing. Wow! And, and that's and that's what he would say to the to his wrestlers. He'd say he'd flex and show them the muscle and go that stops a lot of technique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, the guy's name was Anatoly. Anatoly, but he was a okay. former world champion back in like the seventies, and I don't know if he won an Olympic medal or what. But that was their hired out help. They had a soldier, American soldier, like I said, he was an Olympian. Um, Sean Lewis ended up taking over uh, the program, but they okay. still have a powerhouse team. Uh, the Siraki brothers were in there. I don't know if you know them. Yeah, they were in there with me. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty yeah, cool uh, having, you know, they were all, they ended up 
later they ended up all on the first floor and then all the boxers ended up on the second floor. But okay. at one time, uh, um, Big Byers, he was my neighbor at one time. So, but just cool guys to hang out with and, you yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. Intense, a bunch of intense guys, both sides, right? Yeah. I mean, and we were just friends and supported each other, of course, you know, to, at each other. There's going to be a lot of respect there either way, you know? Yeah. And then going out, I mean, you, you know, you, it, it'd just be a bad idea for anyone, some common guy <laughs> to just get out of pocket. <laughs> You know, that reminds me of, so when I, when I first started kickboxing and doing all that, I was bartending at a place out in Northwest Davenport called Valley Golf at the time. And um, the manager, the bar manager, Mark Burns, who I went to high school with, I brought to him, I said, Hey, why don't we start up? We want to make some money out here. Um, Let's start a flag football league. Right. So we started flag football. Dude, we had, I don't know how many teams, it was like, 70 80 90 teams maybe over 100 teams this thing grew into and we had uh saturday games all day sunday games all day i'm out there refereeing football games like crazy well Pena's had a football team it's like football team right okay and you know most of the time when i would work uh security at nightclubs or whatever and stuff people get in a fight you know People say, Pat, break it up, Pat, break it up. And I go, why? They can't hurt each other, right? <laughs> right. Like, why would I break Just let them get tired, and then I'll throw them out. And so, but not with the Pena boys. Um, one of the teams that they were playing against somehow managed to pick a fight with these guys, and it was it was over really quick. It was it was over really quick. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was pretty bad. It was, it was pretty bad. I felt sorry for the guys because they, they got laid out. Yeah, you know, I listened in to – to your story here and talk about the fights and stuff. I know I had heard, I had watched one of your uh, interviews recently with someone and you shared a story. I don't know if it was Tito Ortiz. Someone got knocked out. Someone had jumped on your back. Yeah. Playing around. I don't know if you want to share that with our viewers. Yeah, that was in, that was in um, London. They had the UFC after the fights had taken two tour buses and loaded up the fighters and their corner men. Uh, after we went back to the hotel and got cleaned out, took us to, cleaned up, and they took us to a a restaurant nightclub type, a real ritzy place in London, downtown London. And anyway, they're free uh, feeding us free food, um, free drink, everything like that. Then, I mean, all of a sudden, all the lights come on in the place, and they say you got to leave. So everybody walks out in the alley. It's daylight. It's five a.m. And I'm like, oh shit. And so anyway, um, guy jumps on my back, who's Tito Ortiz's friend. And it looked like he was choking me, but I could feel he wasn't choking me because I'm the one that he's grabbing. Well, one of my fighters, Tony Fricklin, thought he was choking, thought he had attacked me and was choking me from behind. So he ripped him off my back and started yelling at him. And then one of the English fighters who was friends with with, uh, Lee Murray, um, this big Paul guy, blasts Tito Ortiz's friend in the head and drops him. He goes flying. His arm goes out in the alley and a cab runs over his arm. And instantly the alley blows up into a huge brawl. I mean, like that. And I wasn't, I wasn't in the fight because I just was standing there shocked going, how did, how did that happen so fast from a misunderstanding? Right. And so anyway, um, Tito Ortiz came running past me and he went after Lee Murray. Um, and Lee was, Lee would come over from England and train at my gym. And, um, so Tito threw a couple punches at him. Lee ducked him. And then Lee hit him with a five punch combo and knocked him out cold and started kicking him in the head with steel toed boots. And I grabbed, I grabbed Lee and I said, stop, Lee, you're going to kill him. And Lee took off and left. And, uh, so Tito's laying there unconscious. We helped him up to his feet. And, uh, then a ton of English police showed up and they had OC spray, the big OC canisters. Okay. And they didn't know who they were about to spray. They were going (laughs) to spray an alley, an alley full of UFC fighters. (laughs) <laughs> and, and I'm, we're talking and all their corners and coaches and everybody in the alley knew how to fight. Right. Right. So I, I go, who, which one of you guys is in charge? And uh, one of them told me, and I said, do not spray any of these people with what you're about to spray them with. Cause you're all going to get hurt. And he goes, well, what, what are you talking? I said, these are all UFC fighters. Don't just don't do it. I said, and he goes, all right, you're responsible for getting everybody out of here. So get to work. So I started putting everybody in cabs, got everybody out, out of there and back to the hotel, luckily, because that could have been really bad. Yeah, definitely. Powder cake. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, 
Pat, so you know, I know you're you're in a I know a documentary has recently been done called After the Cage. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that project, how it got um, started, and then kind of really just share with us uh, life after life after the cage. You know, what's that? What's that like? And and you know, for the boxers yeah. that, that follow me, that life after boxing for them. You know. Yeah, you know, it's um, some some people. It's been you know hard on harder on than others um you know some guys have, have had lingering injury uh injuries some guys have um uh, had addiction problems with um you know opioids and painkillers because of uh, spinal injuries or what this and that um and so really it's just kind of telling the story of of guys just trying to get through life right just just uh doing their best and um filmed us uh interacting with with our families with our kids you know um, whatever whatever it is we're doing in life, you know, I've been doing obviously a lot of broadcasting and then I do several other things. I've trained law enforcement and military for a lot of years. And, um, so I've, I've always stayed pretty diversified, um, really mainly because of, of, I never, I never trust, I never trust the economy. I don't trust people in charge of the economy ever. Right. right? right. I'm with so you, I've man. always just tried to, I've always just tried to stay diversified as much as possible. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. Luca, He's originally from Poland. Who he has a very unique perspective on the world because his um, grandfather uh, died in one of uh, Hitler's concentration camps. Wow! And his picture. And Lucas said he was walking through there, and uh, uh, and there was just there's thousands of pictures of the people who died there on the walls. And he was walking through, and he he uh, had never seen a picture of his grandfather before, and he found it. He knew it was him because they looked exactly alike. Mm. And then he tattooed the number. He saw the picture of his grandfather's forearm with the number that was tattooed on his, on the inside of his forearm. And so Luca has that tattooed on the inside of his forearm. And then, so he was, he was from Poland. And when, uh, when Poland fell, when communism fell in Poland, uh, they had, well, they had already left. They had fled the country and uh, he and his mother and father were in, um, a camp. They were held in a camp um, for uh, for I don't know how long he was there, but his perspective on life um, and uh, really what like freedom, what uh, you know the, the different types of governments, how bad things can get, how bad things conditions can get for for human beings in different places around the world. His appreciation is really it's a unique perspective. And so his, his ability to make films, documentaries, um, he, he understands the human element of things. So it's, it's a very, it's a very well done film. All right. Well, we're looking uh, forward to sharing this with our viewers and, and anyone out there who could just benefit from it. So we'll, afterwards yeah. we'll get a link and I'll make sure to include that and drop it below. So, so our followers can share it, view, view it and also share it with people they know. What I'll do is I'll have uh, I can have I can have Luca send you the link. I don't know if I even have the link right now. Okay, but yeah. So, so, if so you it's introduce after the me page, to him so. and yeah, then then uh, just message both of us or something and have him share the link. That'd be great. Absolutely. Um, you got anything it. else that you could leave, say, with our listeners, our followers, just on, you know, one. You know, a lot of them are in there. They're still building the dream. You know, they're still going through the process. So maybe some advice there. Just, I mean, you're a former, you know, world champion. You've trained many world champions. So just there. And then also kind of like how do you prepare yourself for life after combat sports, you know? Right, right. Well, you know, I think my thing was I had to have, you know, that huge why of why I was going to win a world title. And, you know, I went into it. That was the only thing that I really was focused on because I wanted to just hand my mom a title belt. Go, look, mom, you did it. You were a great mother. You know, that's that's what I wanted to know. And but there was nothing going to because my reason, my why was so important to me. I made it so important to me that I there was nothing else that got in my way. No injury got in my way. I had horrible injuries along the along that uh, path to get to that world title um some really bad joint injuries bad spine injuries you know all kinds of stuff like that and uh i just was determined to get i just rehabbed i didn't 
Like I wouldn't even go to the doctor half the time. I just, I'm just going to rehab, take care of it. Um, no setbacks, no, nothing got in my way. Nothing was an excuse to fail. Um, and the more obstacles that were in my way back then, um, the more determined it made me to succeed. Like that would make it that much more sweet to succeed. If I can overcome destroying my knee uh, three months before my UFC debut, right? I had two heavyweights that were wrestling next to me and they both landed on us. My leg was straight because I was against the wall and the guy was trying to take me down off the wall. So one leg was straight and two heavyweights landed on it and, and took it the wrong way and, and tore my knee up pretty bad. And uh, it knocked my tibia out of socket. And I was still able to walk and jog, even though my tibia was partway pushed out of, out of the socket, uh, until a chiropractor felt the back of my leg. And he goes, Dude, what are you doing? And he put it back in. And then, then I could, you know, train a little better. Uh, but the thing is, is uh, because it wouldn't bend all the way uh, while it was out of the joint. But that was the, that's just one example of there can be nothing that gets in your way. Nothing can stop you. No, no obstacle is an excuse to to give up on that um later on in life i guess it's kind of be it's really got to be the same thing so i've been through my ups and downs man i've had my ups and downs and uh, that's just the way it is um but i can't let that stop me right i just can't so, so it's a mindset mental toughness mindset yeah and you know i mean you know i've had to also realize that i mean God's got to be with you. I don't care what your version of God is, but you know, mm -hmm. I would, I would definitely suggest bringing him along with you. Yeah. You know, because, because, uh, you know, we can't, we can't do everything on our own. That's for sure. Things we don't understand that happen to us for whatever reason. Um, but in the end, it's like the Buddhist, the Buddhist, uh, tenant where they're like, it doesn't matter if you're walking across the road and you get hit by a car that runs a red light, you were there, you chose to be there. It is your fault. True. Right. So everything, every misstep I've ever had and everything that I've ever done, ultimately I have to accept it, that it is my fault and I have to fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. So just, and we all, we, we all make mistakes, man. We all make mistakes. Yeah. Well, Pat, it's been an honor to have you on, um, as a guest, love to have you again, anytime. Um, and just uh, looking forward to helping spread the word about After the Cage. I think it's going to be a wonderful documentary that we could all learn something from. Awesome, Steve. Well, thank you for having me, buddy. Hey, thank you, Pat.